Now we're gonna go ahead and hop into our seminar today. I feel very, very lucky to be joined today by Dr. Amanda Stiles, CTO of Trophic and GFI grantee. Amanda is um, just a really brilliant scientist um, who studied plant molecular biology. I got her PhD from Virginia Tech and did her postdoc work at UC Berkeley. She led the research team at Ripple Foods, with, which is a plant-based dairy company. And now she's leading uh, the scientific team at Trophic, which is a company, California-based, that's focused on um, looking really closely at red seaweed as a source of um, better flavors, textures, and all sorts of functional properties for plant-based meat. So I will go ahead and pass it over to Amanda, um, who will dive into this presentation around using red seaweed protein to improve the organoleptics of plant-based meat. Go ahead, Amanda. Super. Um, thank you so much, Amy, and thanks everybody who is attending the call today or watching the webinar later. Um, I'm always excited to talk about seaweed protein and uh, how we can use it for plant-based meat. And uh, a big thank you to GFI, especially as Amy mentioned, we're a GFI grantee. And um, that grant that they provided to us really allowed us to do most of the work that, that I'm gonna talk about today. So a uh, shout out for GFI and all the work that they do. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, what we do at Trophic. And, and just to start out, our overall goal is to make a really new source of protein. Um, from seaweeds, and we believe it could be the most scalable plant-based uh, protein on earth. So we have a big mission and we need a lot of people to help us and uh, love to get everybody's uh, thoughts and opinions on this call. So really looking forward to the, the presentation and especially the Q&A afterwards. So let me get started here. What I'm gonna talk about in this presentation is first Trophic's mission and what we're working on an overview of seaweed itself. Um, when I came into Trophic, I was pretty new to seaweed. So um, I'm just gonna give a broad overview of what that looks like. Um, and then talk about our seaweed protein and functionality. And then just a little bit about the early food products that we're prototyping. So to get started on this, um, Amy already gave a great uh, background on me, but uh, just to reiterate a little bit of that, my, my background's in molecular biology and plant biochemistry. And throughout my career at, um, at Virginia Tech and Berkeley, I was really focused on using plant biochemistry and molecular biology um, to help the world. I wanted to work on environmental projects. So I worked with uh, soybeans and how to um, make them put less phosphorus out into the world, uh, causing eutrophication. At Berkeley, I worked at um, looking at how to phytoremediate uh, phytoremediate oil spills. And, and then I sort of took a step back and I wanted to think about what do I want to do with the rest of my career? And I realized that what's really important to me is finding ways to get people to get their protein from plants rather than from factory farmed animals. Um, that's just, that's my mission. And so I joined up with Ripple. I was lucky enough to be one of the first employees there. And what we were doing there was using pea protein um, and, and other proteins ideally to make plant-based dairy products. And so my role there was to develop methods to fractionate peas and to develop a really clean tasting pea protein. Um, and then about two years ago, I met Beth and she's the initial founder of Trophic and got really excited about the possibility of seaweed protein as a really new protein source for plant-based foods. So the reason we're really excited about seaweed protein is right now where we get our protein uh, is essentially from animals on land or, or fish or crustaceans in the ocean, or we get it from plants on land. And there's a huge white space, uh, especially in Western countries where we just really don't eat sea plants that much. Um, so there's a really big opportunity to be able to change the way that we get most of our protein. And the reason why it's so uh, so scalable is that seaweed is really, really highly productive. So an acre of, of seaweed can make five times more protein than an acre of soybeans. And the other reason is that nitrogen, which is the building block of protein, is primarily found in the ocean. So over 70% of the reactive nitrogen on earth is in the ocean. And not only that, but seaweed is sustainable, it's high quality, quality and it's scalable. 
So it takes no fresh water, no fertilizers, no pesticides. It has all the amino acid. It, it comes with B12, which is often uh, lacking in vegan and vegetarian diets. It's the only plant source of B12. It's got a huge global supply chain already, over 30 million tons per year, uh, and it's inexpensive. It's uh, commodity pricing for some species. So there's a huge opportunity here. So our goal is to use these ocean-grown seaweeds to make the meatiest plant-based protein. So what you're looking at here in this picture is, uh, is some dulse uh, seaweed that is about 20% protein. And we've used our extraction processes to convert it to a 65% protein concentrate. And the reason we call it meaty, uh, I hope you can tell, is its red color is, is really meaty. So sometimes when I'm walking around with a, a tray of uh, seaweed protein, it, it looks kind of scary. It looks like a big pool of blood. So in addition to plant-based meat though, we think it can be a protein source for a lot of different applications, um, high protein snacks, uh, salty snacks, nutrition bars, and new products. Um, new product innovation is a really interesting area. Um, right now as a vegetarian, often the main protein source is tofu or, or things like that, and there's really no other options. So the idea of having center of the plate seaweed protein options is a, a really exciting area that we'd love to see expand. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about marine seaweeds. And to start off, uh, I want to differentiate between seaweed and microalgae. So we often get mixed up between the, people often get mixed up between the two and think that we're working on microalgae. And both are really interesting species, but they're, they're different. And so I wanna highlight those differences for clarity. Um, so to start off, uh, seaweed in general tends to be marine and microalgae freshwater. There's certainly freshwater seaweed and marine microalgae, but when we're talking about this species here, uh, we're talking about marine. And for most of the research that people do on microalgae, they're talking about freshwater. Um, as is clear in the name, uh, seaweed is, is a macro uh, organism, so it's multicellular, whereas microalgae is unicellular. Um, and one of the big differences that, that we hear a lot uh, about is the lipid content. So microalgae is often used for the great uh, huge content of lipids that it has, uh, those omega-3s. It can be anywhere from 20 to 80% lipids, depending on um, different, uh, depending on how it's been treated and, and what sort of conditions it's grown under. Whereas seaweed is a low lipid species. Uh, it's generally about one to 3% lipids. So when we're looking at seaweed as a, a potential protein source, we're really not looking at it from a lipids perspective at all. Um, next is the protein. So seaweed can be up to 45% protein, which was a big surprise to me when I, I realized that. I had no idea that that seaweeds could be so high in protein. Um, and similarly, microalgae can also be high in protein. So with the microalgae, you can see those big ranges there. And that's because people are using it for different purposes, whether they're cultivating it to get high lipids or cultivating it to get high protein. Um, and then a big difference here is ocean harvested versus tanks, ponds, and raceways. So the seaweed generally is grown in the ocean. Uh, there's a few people doing research on tank-based but overall it's an ocean harvested species and microalgae is grown. Um, here's an example of a, of a place where microalgae is grown, generally much smaller. And so that means that the overall um, amount per year is very different. So with seaweed, you have about 30 million tons per year, whereas with microalgae, it's more like 0.1 million tons per year. So with a lot of the alternative proteins right now that people are looking at in the plant-based space, um, you're looking at small areas of cultivation. So you're looking at fermentation tanks um, or, or maybe as with microalgae, looking at ponds and raceways. But for seaweed, this is our bioreactor. The whole ocean is our bioreactor. And we think that's one of the, really the key difference between this and other alternative proteins that we really have the opportunity to make this a hugely scalable protein source. Um, so here's an example of that, the scale of seaweed farming. This is a picture of a Korean seaweed farm from space. And you can see these little blocks are, are all sections of that seaweed farm. So it's a really, uh, a really big uh, operation here. 
And another question we get asked a lot is about the sustainability. And if we start growing seaweed in large farms, is that going to be uh, a negative, uh, have negative effects on the ocean? And so the Nature Conservancy did a study in 2019, um, basically bolstering the idea that seaweed farms are actually really beneficial for the ocean. They deliver restorative benefits um, at the same time as they're supporting economic development and food production. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund just this year uh, announced an investment in seaweed farming. So we're, we're really excited about the idea that it's both a uh, wonderful protein source and sustainable and ocean friendly because that's important to, to all of us at Trophic. So to jump in more about the science, uh, I'm gonna talk about the seaweed composition. Um, so as I mentioned before, seaweed is low in lipids, so only about one to 3%. Uh, there's a big range for minerals. So minerals can be anywhere from five to 35, but the two main parts that we're interested in here are the carbs and fiber and the protein. So right now, most seaweeds are cultivated for these carbs and fiber, and they can be anywhere from 45 to 75%, uh, and the protein can be anywhere from five to 45. So in some species of seaweeds, they've really um, really bred the species to up those carbohydrates and lower the protein. So some we'll talk about later are mostly carbohydrates and just a little protein. Whereas other species like nori, the type of seaweed that you see wrapped around sushi, that one, the protein tastes really good. So it's been cultivated to be high in protein and can be up to 45%. And then just a quick overview of seaweed types. Um, there's red, green, and brown seaweed, three main, uh, three main phylum. Um, there's a lot of different species of seaweed. So I'm just going to be talking about two to four today, but there are thousands of types of different seaweed. So the world is wide open for finding new interesting species uh, that have high protein and grow really fast. And we're really excited about that. The, they're generally grown for their hydrocolloids. And so many people might not realize this, but uh, red seaweeds are where agar and carrageenan come from. Um, so right now, the agar and carrageenan are used in a lot of different food products. Um, you may not even realize all the places that, that carrageenan is used. It's a great emulsifier. Um, it's used even in ice cream, bakery items, um, and agar is used both in the biosciences. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen it there and also in a number of food products. And then alginate comes from brown seaweeds and is used in a little bit of different ways, but it's also used quite a bit in food products. Um, some examples that you might know from different uh, seaweeds are nori and ogo from red seaweeds. So nori is the, the species that wraps around sushi and ogo is the seaweed that's found in poke bowls sometimes. Um, you've probably seen sea lettuce in, uh, in different soups and wakame or wakami, uh, most of us have seen salads and then kelp, everybody knows kelp. So a lot of these species are, are familiar to, to us even if we don't eat them too often. We're gonna focus now on the red seaweeds. Um, we're primarily interested in the red seaweeds because uh, they're some of the most highly cultivated in the world right now. Uh, they have the amazing red color, which is, is perfect for, for meat. Um, so I'm gonna talk about red seaweeds for the rest of the presentation. So when we first started looking at red seaweeds, we really focused in on these four uh, commercial types. So a lot of people may have heard of dulse. Dulse had gained a lot of interest in the press for a while because it tastes a lot like bacon. Uh, when you fry it. So I wish that everybody here was here in person because uh, when we do an in-person presentation, we love to hand out some fried dulse. Uh, it's delicious and is a good, uh, good introduction to seaweed if you haven't eaten too much uh, in the past. Um, but the problem with dulse is that the worldwide production is very limited. Um, it's mostly uh, hand harvested, basically people going out with knives to cut it individually. So it's really hard to uh, get enough supply and the cost per metric ton is quite high. Um, the next one is nori. So everybody has seen a lot of nori. Uh, this is the one that's very high in protein. Um, it's used as a food and it's also a very high source of plant-based B12. There's a lot of worldwide production and the cost is at least cheaper than, than dulse. It's still a little expensive. And then the next two are ogo and guso. So ogo 
uh, is also known as Gracilaria. It, it has a big range for protein, but ovo is primarily grown for the agar. So there's a lot of, uh, there's worldwide in many different locations, uh, ovo is grown to extract the agar and the protein is just a byproduct that's not used. Um, and ogo is much cheaper, so around $500 per metric ton. And the last one I'll talk about is guso. This is where carrageenan comes from. Um, it's very cheap. We're, we're not primarily looking at guso right now because it's been very highly cultivated to be very high in carrageenan and low in protein. So this means just on a cost basis, it, it doesn't make as much sense for us to use but it's definitely uh, interesting to work with. And if you can get a hold of some, I recommend you play with it because it's, uh, it's really fun to see the, uh, the carrageenan uh, come out of the seaweed. So we're gonna focus on nori and ogo. And this is where we've done most of our research. Uh, we, they're really two different, um, two different species. Nori is more expensive, but it has more protein whereas Ogo is cheaper, but it has less protein. So from a cost basis uh, as a company, we're exploring both path pathways at the moment. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about seaweed protein. Uh, and first of all, a lot of questions we get are about why is, uh, why is it red? And it's red because of this uh, molecule called phycoerythrin. So phycoerythrin is one of the main proteins uh, when you uh, make a protein extract. So this is an example of a study where they found that almost 60% of the extracted proteins were phycoerythrin. Uh, sorry about that, I have a phone ringing here. Um, uh, just one moment, I'm going to make that turn off. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the phycobilo proteins are light harvesting protein pigment complexes. Uh, and basically what they do is they work in conjunction with chlorophyll to harvest light and then uh, bring those electrons down to the chlorophyll. So they make the, the seaweed better at harvesting light. And what they do for us is they make the protein that we're extracting red. Um, it's different than most plant species. So most plant species you may have uh, color compounds, but with phycoerythrin, the phycobilo, the phycobilosome is actually covalently bound to the protein. So it's, it's really a, a complex that we're extracting when we extract our protein. Uh, seaweed protein is nutritionally balanced. So this is really exciting looking at all of the different essential amino acids. Um, this is comparing it to the FAO reference for adults and for children. And in almost uh, across the board, we have enough uh, of each amino acid to meet those requirements. Uh, the lowest tends to be uh, in trip, uh, tryptophan. It's a little bit lower than uh, the other amino acids, um, but it's, very, uh, it's, it's right at that line of being enough for an adult for these uh, essential amino acids. All right, and I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the processing. So we do have two patents coming out at the moment that we're working on, uh, on filing on two different processes. So I can't speak too much about the processes that we use, but from a broad perspective, what I wanna talk about is that when we're looking at extracting the protein from, uh, from a plant species, essentially what we're looking at is what makes that protein different from the other components. Um, is it bigger than the other molecules? Is it more soluble than the other molecules? Is it less soluble? Are there ways to break down the other molecules, uh, it's, uh, et cetera? So essentially we're looking at how can we separate the protein from the other molecules? So this is an example here of methodology to do that. So breaking up the, breaking up the initial material, separating it based on different features, doing things like desalting. Um, so as we talked about earlier, there can be a lot of different minerals, um, can be up to 35% of the, the seaweed itself, and then using different methodologies for drying. So we have a few different processes that we're using depending on the species, um, but essentially they're all a, all a mix of, of different types of, uh, of chemistry and, and processing equipment. One of our biggest goals while doing this project was to ensure that the methodology that we used is scalable. So we very specifically wanted to avoid using 
any type of uh, machinery that we had to develop a new new machine for uh, new bioprocessing equipment or using expensive uh, expensive methodology that wasn't going to be able to scale in any economic fashion. So now I'm going to talk about the functional and nutritional characteristics. Um, so starting out, we'll talk about color and color change, water holding capacity, vitamin B12, foaming, texture, and taste. So the title of this presentation is about uh, how seaweed protein impacts the organoleptic properties of plant-based meat. And so most of these properties are what we're focused on. So the color and color change, we have this red protein that's very meat-like to start with. The water holding capacity is something that helps to make plant-based uh, products more uh, juicy and uh, just taste better. Vitamin B12 is something that is very unique to seaweed protein that we can bring along to make the products more nutritious. The texture is one that we're very interested in. So a lot of people, when they're making uh, protein isolates, they, they really want to get just the protein. Whereas with seaweed, what we're looking at is really carrying along some of those, uh, those texturizer, like texturizers like agar or carrageenan. They, they really help to give uh, both texture and protein at the same time, which is, is pretty unique. And they help to hold together the product a little better. Uh, and then lastly, taste. So we're looking at taste from two different directions for a plant-based meat application, like a burger or a steak or something like that. We of course don't want those marine flavors to come through, but if we're working on a seafood product, then those uh, marine flavors can actually be a big benefit. So we work on different processes to tune that taste in different directions. So to start out, uh, seaweed is really interesting because you can make a lot of different colors. So these vials are looking at different, um, different extracts from only a few different species of red seaweeds. And then they're just treated a little bit differently in each case. Uh, they may have been heated, they may have had a pH adjustment, but you can essentially get a really beautiful array of colors. And there's a lot of opportunities to use those different colors in different products. One of the ones we're most interested in is looking at this color and color change. So our protein starts out red because of that phycoerythrin molecule, but in response to heat, it turns brown. And this is something that's missing in a lot of the plant-based burgers or plant-based meat products on the market. Um, beet juice just doesn't change the same way that, uh, that the seaweed protein does. So these are very tiny burgers um, that, that we made as a tester here, but you can see before they're cooked uh, and after they're cooked, the, they go from this pink color to this brown, fully cooked color. And the way that we look at this from a scientific point of view is we measure it using the LAB color table. Um, so essentially L is lightness, white to black, A is uh, red to green, and B is blue to yellow. And so we're using a, a tiny little color meter uh, that's shown up at the top there. And for a visual, uh, demonstration of it, you can see the temperature shift at the bottom. So that's essentially taking a little bit of the initial material, uh, pouring some into another tube and then boiling it. And you can see it go from the pink to the brown color. So this is an example of a side-by-side -side view of that seaweed protein versus beet juice. The top one is a seaweed protein burger. So to get this color change, we only need a very little bit of our seaweed protein. It is very strongly colored. So this is a pretty low percentage that we've put into this burger, but you can see it goes from that pink to brown color. Um, using a commercial burger that we bought at the grocery store, it starts off at a more gray to pink color, and then it does transition to brown in the direct places that have touched the heat. But as you can kind of see that line along the outside, anywhere that it didn't directly touch the grill is still pink. And the problem for me is that when I buy these burgers, uh, they do say, uh, they always say not to overcook, you know, cook for a certain amount of time, but uh, I always overcook them because they're, they're still pink and it, it makes me uncomfortable having a, a still pink burger, even though I know it's uh, plant-based. The next one I'll talk about is moisture. So seaweed protein has a really impressive water holding capacity. 
Uh, in this test, we were looking at a comparison with TBP soy and then looking at our OGO and nori protein. Um, what you see on the right there is essentially a comparison of our seaweed protein. This is nori hydrated at a one to 20 ratio by weight versus soy protein, uh, commercial soy protein that we've purchased uh, at a one to 20 um, ratio by weight. And so you can see one really holds together. Uh, we had a few other pictures where we showed it just holding, holding onto a spoon um, and the soy protein is essentially a soup. So what we get when we look at this, uh, this water capacity is just a really nice gelled material. <clears throat> All right, and the next slide is talking about the nutrition. So uh, as I've talked about before, vitamin B12 is a really important nutrient. And we found that as we develop our concentrate going from the initial material to the concentrate, we're able to uh, both retain and concentrate that, that B12. And so that's something that we'll, we'll definitely be looking at in the future. Um, but essentially, the, if you want to hit the daily requirements of 2.4 micrograms of B12 per day, you only need 3.3 grams of our nori protein or 9.3 grams of OGO. So it's not too hard to, uh, to get those amounts into a, into a burger and really get your daily requirements in a natural way. Foaming is one that uh, we think could have a lot of interesting applications. So foaming means that it'll be a good emulsifier um, and you know potentially for egg products or that sort of thing. Uh, not as much of interest for the plant-based meat that I know of, but we were surprised and interested to see what a good foamer the seaweed protein is. So we did a comparison with uh, commercial soy, pea, soy and pea um, with our OGO protein isolate and our nori protein uh, and found that really our seaweed protein had some uh, impressive foaming capabilities. So this picture on the right here is looking at our OGO uh, after it's been foamed and it's in black and white to just so you can see the foam versus the, uh, the material below a little bit easier. But uh, we were really impressed by the amount of foam that is created and also the foam that's uh, uh, retained after 15 minutes. So what we did here was uh, take the same amount of each type of protein, uh, foam it using a traditional foamer and then pour it into a graduated cylinder and just look at the initial amount of foam. So in soy, we had almost no foam. And of course, later there was no foam. Uh, pea actually foamed really well, but there was very little foam stability. So after 15 minutes, it was mostly gone. Whereas Ogo and Nori, we saw much better foam stability. So we don't have specific applications that we're focusing on using that foaming for right now, but we're interested in the future for looking at opportunities to take advantage of that. The last one I'll talk about is texture. Um, we're really interested in the idea of being able to replace methyl cellulose. So in these tests, uh, we were able to access a texture analyzer for just one day and we ran a bunch of different tests, but what we wanted to really look at, how do we demonstrate quantitatively that the seaweed protein holds the burger together even if you don't add methyl cellulose? Um, and so that's something that we're continuing to look at. Uh, methyl cellulose is one of the I would say scariest items on the label. And we're looking at ways that we could replace it with something that's much more clean label. Um, so in this experiment, what we looked at was using soy with a, a soy uh, commercially purchased with a low uh, amount of methyl cellulose and a normal amount of methyl cellulose, which I think is about 0.5%, 0 0.2 or 0.5%. Um, and then we looked at nori with no methyl cellulose uh, and with methyl cellulose. And so the takeaway here is that the nori with no methyl cellulose was still harder than the soy, um, the soy with methyl cellulose. So looks like my mouse doesn't work. Oh, here we go. So this part here, and this is something that we'd like to move forward and do more um, evaluation of. We weren't able to do a no methyl cellulose soy because it just fell apart into a puddle. And over here, you can see, if you haven't seen a texture analyzer, uh, this was 
my first run with a texture analyzer uh, working on this experiment. What it's basically doing is you're starting out with a material and this, uh, this flat plate comes down and squishes it and measures how much force it takes to, to essentially squish that material down. We're also looking at taste. And so taste is a really important parameter for seaweed protein. Um, like we talked about before, in some applications, it's really great to have that come along. And in some applications, you really want no um, taste at all. And so what we're doing, uh, doing in-house is looking at uh, a taste assay where essentially what we're doing is making several different samples, adding increasing amounts of our uh, seaweed protein, and then seeing if people can I identify the pairs correctly. So if you have seaweed protein in this example in P and R and not in S and K, if the, if the tasters uh, every time can pick out P and R have seaweed protein, then you know that you've uh, exceeded your taste threshold. But if they aren't able to do that pairing uh, reproducibly, so if they pick RS are the same or PK are the same uh, in a, a certain number of samples, then that means that you're pretty close to that, that taste threshold. Uh, right now, their taste is not detectable below 5% <clears throat> by weight in a burger. And so what that means is that in order to achieve our red to brown color change, we're able to uh, do that with no taste perception. We're looking at multiple applications for prototyping. Um, so looking at essentially using different seaweeds and different processes to aim for different potential future products. So for example, looking at a 60% protein gives a nice red color uh, that fits into uh, beef products using a different seaweed with a little bit of a different process starting with lower protein, but getting to a nice uh, umami bacon flavor and something that binds really well, or making one that has a higher amount of protein, 65% protein, and still retains a lot of that seafood uh, marine flavor so that it would be a good, a good protein type for tuna. And this is really early on. So our next steps are essentially to start scaling this up to pilot scale. We're hoping to do that uh, in the first quarter of 2021 and then really get it into the hands of a lot of food formulators. But what you're looking at here is some of the stuff that we've done in house. Um, so we're really looking across the board of how we can use this protein for replacing different meat products. Uh, in the first one, you see a a tuna-based uh, sashimi, a, tu a plant-based tuna sashimi, where we're trying to get that translucent um, texture, but bring that red color in from the seaweed protein. The next is a plant-based bacon, where we're mixing that, that bacon-flavored uh, seaweed protein with some other materials to, to really bring out that umami salty flavor. And in the next one, we're looking at plant-based burgers. So especially using the seaweed protein as a colorant, making that red to brown transition, and also playing with the plant-based jerky and seeing if we can make something that's just a really good high protein snack. So I'll just wrap this up with Trophic is hiring soon. So I know there's a lot of people on the call here and just wanted to get the word out about that. We're looking for a scientist, someone to help with both process and product development. So that means working on the, the process, uh, helping us in this transition from bench scale to pilot scale. We're looking at looking for a process engineer. So this is really in the, the scale up where we'll be um, in, a, in a pilot facility and, and trying to get this to scale uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we're looking for a food scientist. So this is for product formulation. Uh, you can see our, our early work on that, but we really wanna move forward with much more product formulation as soon as we are able to produce higher amounts of protein and a website designer. We're looking at expanding our website. So if anyone on the call or listening to this webinar later uh, has these skills and is interested, we'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much. Um, 
you can visit us uh, right now at trophic.us. Um, if you're interested in testing out our samples, there's a link to our sample request form. And please email us at info at trophic.us. Um, and thanks so much for listening to this presentation. I'm happy to start moving to Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was an awesome seminar. I like by slide five, I was completely sold on seaweed. <laughs> like great wow. along every imaginable dimension, or whether we're talking about, you know, emulsification or the kind of water holding capacity or the color um, and, and, and kind of taste, it just seems, um, and B12 retention, all of the different factors you talked about, in addition to the case you built in the beginning about um, just the scalability and sustainability of, um, of seaweed, I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally sold. Um, I think you've built a really compelling case for red seaweed, and I'm kind of curious to hear your perspective on um, what challenges you think exist with uh, red seaweed in a plant-based protein application when we think about using these novel food technologies um, to feed 10 billion people. What are the challenges, yeah, between where we are today and, and getting there? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, one thing that I didn't talk too much about in this seminar is anything about the supply chain. And so um, right now we have uh, 30 million tons are grown annually, but as we as we want to scale that up and start using that to using seaweed protein to the extent that we hope it can be used, uh, we really need to start increasing that. And so another direction that Tropic is working on is the offshore cultivation systems. Um, so uh, that we have a RPE grant uh, in, and are working in collaboration with other lab on developing some of those technologies for really being able to grow um, seaweed offshore in a much more mechanized way. And there's a lot of things that need to happen to make that um, make that work. So right now, a few of the the things we're looking at are ways to bring deep water nitrogen to the surface to be able to um, provide the nutrients to the plant at the same time that the the light is the highest. So normally, uh, nitrogen comes to the surface in the winter and the seaweed is growing in the summer. So developing uh, essentially upwellers, wave powered upwellers to push that nitrogen from deep water to the surface. Um, and also developing new ways to, um, new moorings to be able to uh, keep the seaweed farms in place and making sure that the seaweed farms are safe, especially for whales. So looking at ways to make sure that, that whales uh, won't become entangled in the system. So developing new materials to make sure that those lines will break rather than entangle a whale. So things like that, I think are um, some of the biggest challenges, just making sure that as the, as the desire for seaweed protein grows, uh, we're able to keep up with supply. Um, and I think one of the, the other challenges that we're closer to home challenge that we're working on is really looking at the taste. Uh, we'd love to be able, taste in plant proteins is, is always a challenge. Um, even soy and pea, you know, after decades of research still have uh, a distinctive flavor. And so we'd love to have a perfectly bland protein that could go into any product. And so that's, that's a near, near term project that we're, we're really focused on right now is, is both targeting our protein for marine um, applications for fish and also making a completely tasteless protein that we can fit into anything. That's awesome. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense that we're still trying to build out the supply chain um, because the potential of seaweed or the entire algal kingdom is just kind of beginning to be understood. Um, so there's a lot of like catching up to do as demand increases. Um, and I loved a point that you touched on in the seminar, um, kind of like ever so lightly. Um, I think, as you just mentioned again, the like seaweed. Um, ocean-like flavor that's captured there makes it kind of perfect for a seafood application, an alternative seafood application. Um, and as we think about how alternative proteins might disrupt local economies as demand increases, um, I think the case for utilizing seaweed as a primary ingredient becomes 
extra strong um, because it's a way to build kind of resilience in ocean side communities that kind of rely on um, sea harvesting of some kind, even if that's not live whole animals. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Very, very cool. Um, so now I would love to pop over to the Q&A here from the audience. Um, there's a question here from Maya. Um, considering you harvest seaweed from the ocean, have you tested for any sorts of bioaccumulation of potentially harmful components in seaweed like plastics, pathogens, chemicals, et cetera, perhaps depending on location or region? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. It's a really important point to think about. And um, I think in some ways you've, you've answered the question yourself. Um, the way, one of the most important uh, things that we're looking at is where do we get the seaweed from? So if you, uh, just like for land plants, if you grow the plant in a polluted soil, you're going to have a polluted plant. And so we have to make sure that where we um, source our seaweed is from really clean water. Um, for the bioaccumulation, there's it, it can bioaccumulate uh, certain compounds, and so we have to make sure that we we don't harvest from those locations. The um, the plastics and microplastics is a is a good question, and to my knowledge, I I'm not sure how much research has been done about that. Um, I would love to learn more about it. It's it's come up um, a, a little bit before with the microplastics. You know, we're we're hearing a lot about how microplastics are are really everywhere throughout the ocean. Um, and I'm not sure about uh, the, the relationship with seaweeds. And so I'm not even sure if it's been studied very well yet. So that's something that, that I would love to learn more about. And it's a great question because, you know, I'd love to get plastics out of our, out of our system altogether and especially uh, out of our oceans. So yeah, it's something I'd love to learn more about. Awesome, thank you. Uh, there's a kind of a related question or a good follow up question to this. Um, it's about where you source most of your red seaweed supply. Um, and you would kind of talked about, I think something we experience a lot of in the plant based meat space is like the um, inability to source a lot of consistent batches, like there's a lot of batch to batch variation. And you touched on that too, with different protein content ranges, depending on where you source. Um, so can you, yeah, shed some light on your supplier? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're really looking in a number of different locations. Um, primarily right now, we're sourcing from Korea. Um, in Korea, there's a, a long history of uh, food-based seaweeds. And so, especially when we're looking at our, our nori and ogo, it's a great location. Um, but the seaweed is grown all over the world. So um, we're also looking in uh, South America. There's a, a big industry there, especially for the ogo. We we're looking in China as well. China is one of the, the biggest producers of seaweed in the world. Um, and so as we build out our supply chain, we're, we're really looking to to move into China as well and just learn more about what opportunities are there. And so, um, so as I mentioned with hiring, that's another thing that we're, we're definitely looking for is, is people that can help us build out those uh, supply chains, especially in Asia. Um, it's something that we're, uh, for the, the next quarter, we're really focused on doing. Fantastic, thank you. Um, here's a question from Mark Langley. Methyl cellulose is a thermoreversible gel with multiple states of texture according to temperature. It can be tuned according to manufacturer's needs, whether binding, firmness, juiciness, et cetera. So can you compare seaweed's properties along these dimensions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we're really early in the analysis of of our different texture properties. So I'd say we're too early to really compare. I mean, methyl cellulose, <laughs> as you mentioned, is, is a really amazing gel. Um, just playing with it a little bit in the lab, we've been really impressed with its capabilities. So, so as far as, um, as tuning it, that's something that we're really, really early in, but uh, is really gonna be one of our R&D push, uh, pushes on how can we study this? How can we make the seaweed protein an even better texturizer? The main direction that we've looked at it uh, so far with seaweed protein is, is in that binding, that initial binding um, in a burger, for example, of how it holds together when we mix TVP and some coconut oil and some uh, you know, sunflower oil together. How does it hold that burger together? And how does it hold the burger together as it's cooked? Um, 
So we really want something that will bind the burger and will hold the burger together um, during and after cooking. So it, it seems as similar to, to uh, uh, true meat as possible. But um, yeah, we'd love to study. We'd love to get into it and study it some more and see the more that we can replace methyl cellulose, um, the more attractive as a texturizer it'll be. Awesome. There's a kind of a question that you just touched on a little bit towards the tail end of this answer. Um, but what other ingredients do you think will play an important role in the textural properties of seaweed based meat analogs? Um, so what, what, what do you think about a blend of maybe seaweed based proteins and some legumes based proteins for a meat analog formulation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So our early burgers uh, right now are, are just using a small amount of, of protein for the colorant. And we've also explored using more to increase it as a texturizer. So our early, early burgers are using uh, a lot of TVP or soy. And so I really don't see seaweed protein as being an either or, you know, we're really trying to build the plant-based um, meat uh, meat worlds and make really delicious products that people would prefer to eat over the the true meat, um, you know, comparisons. And so we'd be happy to use other ingredients like soy, um, soy pea. Uh, we have done a little bit of experimenting with soy, and under certain conditions, it can be a good um, gelling agent. And so we're we're definitely open to exploring that, and that's something that we'll look at. Fantastic. Thank you. Here's a question from Michael, who says you gave a really amazing talk. Um, do the red seaweeds you work with tolerate environmental change, um, as you would see if the technology were to be expanded globally? Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting question. I think that, that one of the biggest challenges with uh, global climate change right now is the, the raising sea temperatures and you know just a little bit of change in uh, in ocean temperatures can have an impact on on seaweeds and so i'd say we don't know yet really um, how big of an impact that's going to be that's something that's that's being studied right now there's uh, seaweeds are not uh, to my knowledge seaweeds haven't been um, worked with as much in the biotechnology sector or breeding sector as much as with land plants but when they when they have been studied, a lot has been along those lines, looking at increasing the, the ability to grow for a longer growing season. And I think that looking at the ability to grow in, in very slightly warmer oceans may be something that, that comes up soon as we, we see these changes. Yeah, thank you. The, I think there are some related questions here that I can touch on. Um, it's about whether or not there are any benefits that you you know of to growing macroalgae in tanks, maybe on land, um, utilizing like a vertical farming type of model. Do you see any benefits to that kind of production? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the most uh, important reasons that, that we'd love to see that is just uh, is working on the breeding programs, um, being able to, you know, right now seaweeds have been bred for generations to be high in hydrocolloids and low in protein. And, you know, for this to be a major protein source that needs to, to change. We'd love to see a, a fast growing, very robust, high protein seaweed. And so I think the, the tank based cultivation will be really key to that, being able to uh, learn more about breeding species. Um, and also, you know, for, I, I think the, the main reason not to do tank based is just uh, long term costs. It makes for a very expensive product just for the, the cap, uh, capital expenditures for, for building tanks, you know, compared to growing it in the ocean. But for specialty products or for building a product, um, you know, if, if consumers are concerned about um, the pollutants that we talked about, you know, wanting to have one that they're 100% sure is, is free of microplastics uh, and that sort of thing. Um, there's definitely an opportunity there. Um, but I think I'm most excited about it from the, the scientific point of view. So um, I think that was Fiona that, that asked that and, you know, love to love to chat with you about that because I think it's a, a really exciting project that uh, that's being worked on. Sweet. Yeah, it sounds like a very exciting project. Um, there are some questions here about exploring plant-based chicken applications for um, your red seaweed protein. And 
Um, I know that's not an application you've explored quite yet. Um, can you speak to what some of the considerations might be as you explore that application and whether you think there's a way to um, almost like reduce the, the natural color that comes with red seaweed in some of these like wider meat applications? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the main reason that we haven't explored that too, um, in too much depth because we do have a red protein right now. But, um, you know, the, the two ways that we are looking at that long term is looking at ways to make our protein colorless. So the protein is covalently bonded to the, the color molecule. Um, so if there's ways to either photo bleach or cleave that molecule off, there's, there would be ways to make it colorless. Um, all of the protein in red seaweeds is not phycoerythrin. So there is a, a percentage of protein that is, is not colored. So that's another direction we can look at. And then lastly, we're, we are looking at other species um, like brown seaweeds that don't have that, um, those same color compounds involved. And so really, I think that would be something a little bit farther down the line. Right now, we're, we're really interested in taking advantage of having this unique property of having a red protein, but as seaweed protein expands as we, as we expect it to, then we'd love to look for applications uh, where we could have a, a whiter protein that would be good for fish applications or chicken applications and, and just other opportunities. Perfect, thank you. Here's another question from Mary Lise. Um, you mentioned that in the burger right now, no more than 5% of the seaweed protein should be added in order to mitigate for any like off flavors. Um, but what about the fish products where the seaweed taste is kind of a, a really positive attribute? Can we make the fish analogs totally from the seaweed protein? Or do you think even in those applications we'll need other kinds of plant-based proteins? Yeah, um, that's, I, I'm not sure, to be honest. That's something that we're looking at right now. Um, one challenge that we have is that our protein is very dark. And so um, if you saw, if you remember the picture of the, the jerky, that plant-based jerky, that one has a lot of protein and it's a really dark color. And so right now we're really looking at mixing other proteins in to be able to lighten that color and, and get to the, the pink color. Um, in our tuna sashimi uh, early prototype, that one is fully a seaweed protein. It's just mixed with other texturizers that would uh, that help to lighten up the, the color to some extent. So um, from a taste perspective, I think that we probably could use it, um, use 100% seaweed protein as the protein source. And from a color perspective, it's something that we're still evaluating. Yeah, I did think that picture was so cool. The kind of translucency that you were able to obtain. Very, very cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, here's a question from Celine. Will you need regulatory approval for your products, even though they're derived from seaweeds that are currently used in existing food products? Yeah, we, we may is the answer. So we'll be looking at uh, grass status next year. Um, what we need before um, looking at grass status is we need to have everything locked in. So we need to have our supply chain locked in, our process um, at scale locked in and so that we can really evaluate it um, from a grass standpoint. But that's something that we'll be looking at. We've talked to a couple companies about it. It looks like we, probably will need it. And the reason is, even though it's a food product, um, what we're creating is, is a product where people eat a lot more of the protein than they normally would. So if you eat a little bit of seaweed, um, like wrapped around sushi, that's a, that's a specific amount that you have as a daily intake. And what they would want to demonstrate with um, in a grass status process is that if we made a burger out of, say, nori protein, where you'd be consuming much more than you normally would, that that's still uh, safe. Our, and our expectation is that that process, uh, if we need to do it, will go fairly quickly because um, they are food products that have been consumed for thousands of years um, and there's no allergenicity uh, issues and things like that. So. We expect that it's likely that we will need to get grass status and that uh, it should be a fairly knock on wood, easy process. Awesome. Yes, fingers crossed that it's a super <laughs> process. 
Um, here's a question from Bennett, um, who again reiterates that this was just such an awesome presentation. Um, how do you see your business model? Are you planning to create your own consumer facing brand or, you know, be more of a B2B business selling food uh, or selling ingredients to other food companies? Yeah, great question. It's something that, that we've really thought a lot about um, and, and really considered both models. Um, we think that we're going to go first with a consumer facing brand. And the reason for that is that seaweed protein is a new product and we'd really like to get something delicious out on the market that consumers love and uh, you know, it becomes a, a, a new protein that's really normalized and people are excited about and really highlights uh, both the nutritional benefits and the, the taste benefits of using seaweed protein. So since we're really uh, one of the first movers in this space, we think that uh, we need to demonstrate the best product first to, to get the world on board. And, and in the future, we can both uh, create new products and potentially sell protein to other companies as well. Awesome, that's such an exciting approach. Um, very excited to one day have Trophic pro uh, products on the dinner table. Um, nice. Yeah, here's a question from Sudhir. Have you considered using the foaming and hydrophilic properties of red seaweed proteins to make stable gels with lipids for keeping the products more stable during cooking so that the fat doesn't leak out? Um, I love this idea. Thank you for uh, for bringing it up. Um, no, I really haven't considered that. Um, you know, the foaming has so far been sort of something that's of interest to us. It was a surprising property and um, not something that we've played around with very much. So um, I'll definitely, definitely think about that. Um, you know, I know it's a, a big issue in plant-based meat, having, uh, having the lipids squeeze out during the cooking process. And we have noticed uh, in our burger prototypes that it does not seem to happen very much. We, um, we decided we haven't measured it specifically yet. We've looked at some, some ways to do that and haven't, uh, haven't quantified it yet, but just visually it looks like the, um, the oil is not leaking out as much as with other burgers. So maybe that's a reason. And uh, yeah, I'd love to, uh, love to chat more about it. So feel free to contact us at Trophic. Love to talk more about that idea. Yeah, that's perfect. Because Sudhir also um, is, is based out of your alma mater, UC Berkeley. Oh, uh, great. Yeah. So there's, um, maybe there's a potential collaboration there. Um, a question here from Mark. Um, you had you touched on um, a lot of the organoleptic properties of uh, seaweed and, and plant-based meats, and, and you have also touched on the functional and nutritional benefits as well when you talked about B12 retention um, and, yeah, some of the other um, major properties. But Mark is asking if you can give the cliff notes on the functional and nutritional benefits of red seaweeds, and there are a few questions sprinkled throughout about the PDCAAS rating of seaweed protein, so if you can touch on that too, that'd be great. Yeah, um, so for the functional and nutritional benefits, um, you know, I think the nutritional benefits are really focused on being a complete protein that has all the essential amino acids, the, the B12 that it brings along. Um, there's definitely a lot of research on seaweeds and bioactive properties. And that's something that we haven't looked at too, um, too much in depth yet. Um, but I think it's a, a really interesting field um, when it's been used as uh, fish feed, for example, it's created, it's um, worked as a, to help their immune system. So essentially made the fish that had the seaweed protein more um, resistant to disease. Um, and the, the list of bioactive properties is just, just really long and extensive on all the things that seaweed is purported to do. Um, so I think that would be really interesting to learn more about, um, and, and that's probably an area of nutritional benefits that we'll explore uh, in the future. Um, for the PDCAS, we, uh, our group has not done a PDCAS analysis um, yet. So most, uh, most of the PDCAS, there's very little research on PDCAS of seaweeds that I've found so far. Most of it gives a PD cast somewhere similar to legumes. But the issue with those studies is that the, in those studies, when you're looking at whole seaweed, the protein is mixed with the hydrocolloids. 
And that means when you're looking at the digestibility of the, the protein, it's, it's all mixed with something that's indigestible. So what we'd love to do in the future is to run our own PDCAS uh, on our seaweed protein. And our expectation is that it would, um, it would be much higher. There was a group that recently presented on a, a very similar type of seaweed protein concentrate. And they did an in vitro study of digestibility and found that um, at the intestinal stage, it was 100% digested. They did, um, I believe, Brassillaria cornea, a, um, an extract from there. So that was very promising, um, very promising data that when we do our, our digestibility studies that we have an expectation that it's going to be very high. And so, so PDCAS is basically a mixture of two parameters. Um, the essential amino acids, which we've got great scores on those, and then the digestibility. And so the digestibility is the piece that we're missing, but based on, based on that data from the group, I believe it was a group in Israel, um, we're, we're very uh, optimistic that we'll have a really great PDCAS score. Sweet. That's really exciting. I um, will also drop here in the chat a resource that GFI um, built over the last few months, um, which dives into, it's our plant protein primer. I don't believe it touches on seaweed, um, but it does touch on a lot of other um, plant sources in the kingdom um, that uh, you can see the PDCAS scores for a lot of those um, different plant materials as you evaluate which ingredients to use in your formulations. Um, so that should be helpful, hopefully, to some of you. Um, there's a question here from Sajid. Uh, what are your thoughts on using spirulina as a protein ingredient for meat analogs? Do you see this as a potentially powerful protein source? Yeah. Um, you know, before I even joined Trophic, um, back when I was in grad school, uh, I was really interested in spirulina. I, I tried to, uh, to buy some and grow it on my own so I could cultivate it in-house and, uh, and just eat this stuff at, at my own house. So I think spir spirulina is an amazing protein source. Um, I don't honestly know that much about its functionality. So I, I learned a lot about what an exciting protein it was, but I've never really used it in plant-based meat applications. So I don't know how its functionality uh, and the functionality overall of micro, uh, microalgal proteins. Um, I just don't know that much about them. When I was working in plant-based dairy, we, we had to look for really inexpensive proteins um, to be able to try and get to cost parity with um, dairy products. And so we were more focused in the, the commodity pricing range. So I haven't played with um, the proteins to learn about their functionalities, but you know we'd certainly be open to it. Um, I, I think that the the algal world in general uh, needs uh, needs to be integrated more into plant based food. So I'd certainly be open to it. I just don't don't know that much about it yet. Great. Uh, let's see. We still have seven or so questions. If there are any that speak to you in particular that you'd like to get to, feel free. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Let me just fly through these. Um, oh, so there's a question about an extruder, and that is definitely on our list. We would love to see what happens. Um, to our knowledge, there's been very little research on looking at the extrusion of seaweed proteins um, or even seaweed uh, in general. And so that's um, that's an area of research that we'd love to get into. I think it the the mixture of the hydrocolloids and the protein, I believe, could make some really interesting. Uh, products through extrusion. So we'd, uh, we'd love to try that. And uh, if your... anyone has some, some access, I'd love to chat with you. <laughs> what are your existing methods for texturizing your plant, um, plant-based meat product prototypes? So right now we're just using a base recipe. So when I make my, um, my burgers, I'm essentially just uh, doing, uh, I'm starting with TVP. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting with TVP, hydrating, adding oil, adding our seaweed protein, um, and then uh, adding yes or no with methyl cellulose, mixing it together, and then adding some coconut, uh, frozen coconut bits to get that sort of speckling, that white speckling. So we haven't looked too much at texturizing our protein yet, but um, with extrusion or, or other methodologies, we'd, we'd love to try it. We have been interested in using the other hydrocolloids from seaweed. So 
um, testing out, especially using agar or alginate or carrageenan, looking at what additional textures. Um, in some ways, it seems a little silly to separate them and then put them back together, but um, being able to really tune that interaction is, is something that I think could create some, some very interesting new textures. Fantastic. Um, there's a question here um, around, um, yeah, I, I don't know if you um, have an answer to this question, but what are the reasons for the like wide variation in protein content that we see across the, the different seafood, uh, seaweed species? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a couple of reasons, but I think the most important reason is that the most highly cultivated species have been bred for specific attributes. So the, the guso or um, yukuma has been bred to make car carrageenan. So it's been selected over and over again to get really high carrageenan and really low protein. Um, and the same with the agar species, they've been really selected to get a lot of agar and, and low protein because in those cases, it's just a byproduct. Whereas with the, the nori, it's been really highly selected to um, be high in protein because the, the protein tastes good and it's an attribute there. Um, there's also some seasonality um, changes. So in the winter, the, as the, the nitrogen comes to the surface uh, naturally, that's when the seaweeds tend to become higher in protein. So there's definitely seasonal variation. Um, what we would love to, to see with the breeding program, I, I think I mentioned it before, but would be a, a fast growing um, high protein species. Right now, nori is, a, is really nice that it's high in protein, but it's a, a very delicate um, species. So we'd love to see something robust like kelp that could grow fast and big and would have a lot of protein. And, up until this point, nobody has needed that. So uh, I think that's why it hasn't been cultivated to a, a large extent. And, you know, there's thousands of, of seaweed uh, types out there. So it'd be interesting just to, to learn more about what's already out there in nature. Yeah, so breeding for hardiness. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah, so here's a question from Boris um, about whether or not you can estimate the price for your product and how it might um, compare with other types of proteins. Yeah, um, our, our goal is to long term be able to beat soy on price. Um, starting out of the gate as a new protein, of course, we're going to be higher than that. So Right now, we're estimating somewhere around eight to ten dollars a kilogram um, starting out, and that's based on essentially looking at the cost of the material, looking at the um, the processing cost, which means um, you know the equipment and the labor and things like that, um, and also we expect to be able to earn some value on the byproducts. So since we're we're still doing a, a separation of the the main hydrocolloids and the protein we're looking at potential either products we can make with those hydrocolloids um, or if we're able to sell those hydrocolloids. But so right now we're, we're aiming for that eight to $10 a kilogram and expect to, uh, and have a plan for going down the, the cost curve to eventually aim more at about $2 a kilogram long-term. Very, very exciting. Um, here is a suggestion from Sajid. You should try hydrogelation techniques with some effective hydrocolloids as water holding agents. Great, thank you. Um, <laughs> and I would love to chat more about that because that's uh, that's really not my field. And I would love to uh, love to chat about um, some of these great ideas that are coming up. So feel free to to reach out. I would love to hear from you. Awesome. Um, here are, there are just three more questions here in the chat. Are there any, um, and Maytal just popped one in there, <laughs> even as a fourth, with large variations in protein content, how do you control, um, yeah, the quality of the extraction procedure for obtaining a more consistent extract um, in terms of protein content? Yeah, um, that's something that we're really working on with our process. We want to ensure that our process is very robust for, for the end protein content. So whether the material starts with 20% um, protein or 25% protein, what we want to see at the end is um, a 65% protein concentrate um, so that the variation we hit will be in the, the byproducts that we see. Um, so essentially, we're designing our process to 
be able to really accept that variation um, in source material so that we come out with a consistent, uh, consistent end product. Uh, it's certainly important. So one of the things we'll be looking at as we move to pilot is essentially answering that question, taking um, taking seaweeds of different protein contents, running them through our process to evaluate how robust the process is. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, looks like there are a couple more questions here. Um, I'm not sure what some of them mean. So if there are any that... Um, that yeah, I can take them. Yeah, yeah no problem. Um, the first one I see is, is the B12 real or uh, um, B12 similar? And that's a good question. Um, it's, so when B12 is analyzed, it can often be either true B12 that the body takes up like real B12, or it can be a B12 analog that essentially doesn't help you at all. And so in seaweeds, um, people have seen, seen both varieties. Um, and so that's a reason why there's, there's been a lot of research on seaweed and B12, and it's been a little bit conflicting. And that's the, the likely hypothesis for why the research is conflicting. So in some cases, for example, mice are fed seaweed and their B12 um, serum levels increase. And in some uh, cases, they don't. Um, so there's analytical methods to determine if that B12 is, is real or a biosimilar. And um, that's something that if we you know, as we get further in our research, and if we made any claims about B12, we would need to run those tests. Um, what we've done so far is the microbiological method, which um, is more challenging to differentiate those two. Um, but based on, based on the bulk of the research with Norian B12, we believe that it is the, the real B12. Um, but before we put anything on a, a label, we would do those much more robust uh, analyses to, to make sure that it's the real B12. Great question. It's a, it's a really um, challenging part of the B12 field. Um, the next one uh, was about, are the proteins denatured? And that depends on our process. So we have a couple of different processes um, depending on the initial material and um, and essentially in some of the processes, the proteins are denatured. We have a couple processes that are a little harsher um, and those proteins will, they still have color, but they'll be a little bit less functional in some attributes. So those proteins we're looking more at uh, a colorant um, or using in things like protein bars and things like that. We have processes for other uh, seaweeds that they, um, they are not denatured. The, the process is much gentler and allows for extraction of soluble proteins that, that really protects that structure. Um, does the, next question is, does the good texture come from the hydrocolloid? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's a good question. Um, my expectation is that it may be a mix um, you know, we could we could answer that question pretty easily, I think, by just isolating the pure hydrocolloids and foaming it versus the mixture of protein. So that that'd be a really interesting uh, thing to do. Um, I've never heard of agar um, being a good foamer. So and that is the main hydrocolloid of the the two that we're looking at. So I would be surprised, um, but it could be an interaction between the two, or it might just be the protein alone. So. So it'll be, that's an interesting area to look into to get a better understanding of that foaming. And the last one is, is our protein a mix, a uh, complex mix of proteins or dominated by phycoerythrin? Um, we are doing a, so to answer that, we are doing a bulk protein isolation. And so it really depends on the initial material, what percentage of that is, is phycoerythrin. Um, so it, it can vary, but we're, we're not focused on only extracting phycoerythrin, we're, we're essentially, our goal is to extract all the proteins uh, that, that we can from the seaweed.